would have had to step forward and seize the moment when the state was, um, was weak, when, it was, uh, the, when the players, as the army, for example, were disoriented, when, when the world didn't yet know how to deal with this, step forward and seize that moment to put in place something more permanent and that could actually rival the you know, state time that Omar was talking about. Of course, we don't have a political leadership as such because we've been you know, under regimes that, that, uh, that precluded that for the last 60 years, but we did have a, a sort of self-styled opposition class um, and people who put themselves forward as and, and who had lived in opposition actually quite honorably for years. And they were the ones who actually did step forward and who were supposed to be talking to the army and negotiating and so on on behalf of the revolution, and they failed. I mean, if there is a failure to, to be marked, then it is, it is that failure to seize that moment with and to trust the street and to actually put themselves in alignment with the ambitions and, and the um, optimism of the street and turn that into political gain. And that small kind of coterie of people who saw themselves as um, opposition uh, you know, figures failed to do that. They fa failed to seize the moment, yeah. Uh, Yasmin, what would, what would you think? What, what's your, do you have a, a different explanation or more to add on, on the what went wrong theme? I mean, I, I agree with both of, of both um, Omar and Ahdef. I, it's interesting hearing Ahdef because, I mean, from my perspective or how I carried it is that, you know, as Omar said, I think that it was so much in the moment and there was this micro view of the moment and what we were feeling and the emotions and the, the aspiration, this, this supposedly longer term view, I don't think that, I feel that there was a sense that it would be reached immediately, that there would be this leap somehow. Um, and so I've emotionally carried the sense that, that we failed because of the inability to organize and we being the streets. Um, and I, I mean, the, you know, blaming, of course, you know, one looks at what happened with, you know, the army and, and um, I, I mean, I, I, I think the, the, the tendency to assign blame maybe has also held us back at moments. Um, which has been how I've moved forward, I think, blaming, carrying the blame in some sense. It's, 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 it's difficult to, but don't you think one has to move away from that sort of blame game? And I mean, I think, you know, there is a, the exercise of trying to see things in a longer historical mm. sense, maybe one way of healing as well. Max, if I may cut in. I mean, we talk about blame when we're put in this situation when somebody says what went wrong and why did it go wrong, and therefore you have to talk about that. And yet, I don't think, I mean, nobody's sitting around blaming people, but one has to learn from the past, and that's, that's really the issue. That um, I, I think that where we are is that one has to now understand that however much, however many people come out onto the street, and however seriously they're motivated, and however, um, charismatic and articulate and smart and brilliant the young people are who find themselves in a position where the street coheres around them, everybody's going to be killed unless somewhere there is a, a, an, an organization. There is somebody who is able and prepared to step forward and to actually take power. So, you know, that's the lesson to be learned, really, I think. I think also, um, if I may add the difference between... I mean, when I say I carried that is that, and I don't know if all of you know, but Amr and Ahdef, their family are, I mean, they are, if there is a family of activists in Egypt, it's, it's you. And we, and we've, I, I'm from a family that's not political at all. And, and so I carry that, and that is my background. And so I watched, there was a point where, um, there were small protests that continued and that I would look at the photographs and Ahdef would be there and her sister would be there and I was definitely at home. My stamina ended at a point when theirs kept going. And so there's also that, you know, the, um, sort of that, the questioning of that for me in terms of energy and stamina and engagement and commitment. 
And I th I, uh, to move on a little bit, I mean, uh, during that whole phase of the so-called Arab Spring, as things spread from one country to another, uh, there was a, uh, I mean, it was an extraordinary kind of infection that, that covered, you know, 10, 20, 10 or 15 countries uh, in, in sequence, all in the space of about six months. And the, the sort of historical moment that it seemed most like, actually, was Europe in 1848, when there was this so-called Spring of Nations, where there were more than 20 uh, revolutions all across Europe, all in the same year, and uh, all of them failed. I mean, they were all crushed within, a, within one year. But about 30 years later, in about 1870, nearly all the things that people had fought for in those revolutions were actually achieved. But they were just achieved on a different time scale. I mean, do you think it might be, you know, do you, do you expect that some of the demands that were actually uh, made by the revolutionaries on the streets of Cairo and other cities across the Arab world will actually be achieved on a different time scale? I mean, are you op more optimistic for the longer term? Uh, Omar, I'll, I'll ask you first. Yeah, I mean, I think 1848 is definitely the best parallel now that we're at this point within our kind of history to be able to look at it. And, um, and of course, time is moving much faster now. Technologically, we're able to communicate at a speed that is much, much faster than 1848. And so you can see history is moving forward at an identifiably faster pace. Um, on the one hand, yes, I mean, I do think probably that there is a scenario in which I think that the way to look at the Arab Spring and the events of 2011 is one battle in the kind of collapse of neoliberalism that we're seeing, and it's one of the shockwaves of post-2008, and it's also a sort of shockwave against the Iraq war and the history of colonialism, and I think it was very much pinned and presented itself as an anti-capitalist and anti-colonialist uprising that then spread internationally. Um, I think we therefore kind of can't but see it unless we look at also the continuing indicators of this kind of crisis that we can see that the world is entering into globally, right? There is this lurch to the right, there is this crisis of capitalism, there is the seizure of international institutions of kind of neoliberal or bi neoliberal doctrine. And I think that the Arab Spring was part of that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether that means that in 30 years, like, capitalism will have collapsed and something else will be in its place. But I think it's certainly possible, looking at it now. I mean, it does seem that there is a collapse happening all around us. Um, and like in all other kind of points of collapse, it's a question of whether the left actually has the organization and the ideas and the street power to step into a vacuum. Or what seems more the case now, that you know the right is harvesting this sort of chaos and discontent and... Uh, and kind of using it to, to, to frame the narrative around the kind of the collapse being that the necessity is what you need as the nation and the right and security and stability and borders rather than the collapse is because of the forces that are creating these impetuses in the first place and what you need is the antithesis of these things. Yeah, and I suppose, I mean, they say that, you know, a revolution is made from hope uh, and this isn't really necessarily a moment of hope, it's more of a moment of despair, which is uh, uh, what doesn't make revolution. So perhaps you've moved definitely beyond a revolutionary moment. But what do you think, Ahadaf? I mean, do you think that the things that people were asking for in, in, this, in, this, in, in Cairo will, be, will come to them in, in just in a different time frame or in a different... I mean, how, 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 how do you think that, that, that those hopes will, will be achieved? <clears throat> well, I, I, I really, I do agree very much with Omar in that... Uh, in that I don't think you can, you can see Egypt in isolation. Um, I mean, even in, in, in practical terms, the regime we have in Egypt wouldn't last five minutes without the support of, um, of Saudi, the Gulf, um, the United States, uh, the, the EU, uh, and so on. So really, there is a, a, a global system that manifests itself in different countries. I mean, you have it here. I mean, there's a clear manifestation of, of this issue of the rise of the right and uh, the nation state, the borders, the militarism, and so on. You can see it here in India, you see it in the United States, um, in Eastern Europe, and so on. Egypt is, is very much part of that. So if, if I'm asked to look at Egypt alone and say, will we get, you know, whatever, democracy and freedom of expression and uh, human rights, in 30 years the way we're going now? No, absolutely not. Um, totally not. 
But if we think in global terms and if we think that actually um, the stakes are really, really high because under the current system, the planet itself is not going to survive. And young people all over the world know this. And so there is, there is a, a, a reason, there's a motivation rather than simply um, you know, the old kind of left-wing insistence on, on humanist values. Uh, there's now a survival uh, reason to actually try to dismantle the system that is strangling the whole world. Yasmin, would you, do you want to weigh in on this? Uh, well, I think, I mean, from a very different perspective, when I look at the young people in Egypt today, there's this generation that came of age, you know, during the revolution, and I feel that they're quite different, certainly to my generation. They're, they seem very uninhibited, they're quite outspoken, and when I look at what's happening in the States right now with the Congress, this new Congress, I feel that there are, there are you know, young people in Egypt who have that, who have these you know, strong ideas. They're, they're, they don't have a, the sort of fear that was instilled in my generation. Um, and and I, 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 it's hard to imagine that they're going to be as quiet as we were. And then there are also deeper changes, in, I mean, social changes that were accelerated by the revolutionary moment that might not be, uh, might not take instant sort of political expression. I mean, as you suggest, I mean, like relations between sexes, for example. I mean, there's been a lot of such subtle, uh, more subtle social change uh, in, in Egypt, wouldn't you say? I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think hugely so. Yeah. Um, the conversation sometimes I hear on the streets or in, uh, astound me, you know. There's a there's much more of an openness on that level, and it's sort of challenging uh, of all kinds of social norms. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Of course, that there is social change that has been expressed or triggered by the revolution. It's moving fast, particularly among the young. But I I don't really see that as sustainable without political change because these very young are also, while they're going through their moment of social change and openness and so on, are also being crushed. They're being crushed by economics, they're being crushed by, <clears throat> um, you know, the possibility. I mean, ev every single day, at least one person is disappeared off the streets, for example. Um, many, many people are trying to get out because they can't, they can't find jobs or because of the, the repression. So, while social change is really, is really important and really good and is an indicator, it does need a different political and economic climate if it's going to, thrive, to, to, to thrive. Yeah, the, the current moment is pretty hard. I mean, what, 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 how would you characterize it, Omar? The, the current moment in Egypt, I mean. How would I characterize it? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, what, what, what I was just thinking now is when we talk about failures and, I mean, I wonder if, you know, it feels like the world and history moves through revolutionary eras and then moves out of them. And I kind of wonder if actually one of our kind of greatest mistakes has been to sort of totally cede even the fact of revolution to the right and to kind of accept that we've kind of entered a kind of cold phase rather than actually considering this sort of continual collapse that we were talking about and this like absolute festivities that the right are having. Um, and to kind of consider ourselves as being a continuing age of kind of change and transience. But anyway, um, the situation in Egypt, yes, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's an out-and-out -out dictatorship. Uh, but, yeah, I don't, um, <laughs> yeah, it's sort of grim. Uh, okay, we I, don't need I, to go into great detail. Yeah, I, uh, um, did you want to add, add I something? I mean, I wonder how people, yeah, every yeah. day I wonder how people economically are surviving. Like when I go into the supermarket, I'm, I, uh, I'm shocked at how much we pay for so little now. And I just, I wonder how people, you know, there must be a breaking point. I don't know, when, since they floated the, you know, unpacked the, 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 the pound. Um, and I, I, um, can we ask you a question as the economist? Sure, absolutely, you may. Yeah, <laughs> would you like to? I mean, how does it, you know, like, where does a breaking point come economically when, when inflation is so high and prices are rising and, you know? Uh, very difficult, but as, as 
you know, I was saying um, the kind of revolutionary moment often doesn't happen in moments of, of economic contraction, but actually expansion. Uh, that's when that's when revolutions happen when there's a little bit of a bit, little bit more fat on the body and people feel they can sacrifice something. But when people are really living hand to mouth, that's often a moment of quiet. And I'm afraid that's that's where where Egypt is right now. Yeah. Um, but to 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 move on to something a little more hopeful. Um, having gone through this revolutionary experience, uh, perhaps there's someone in the audience who'd like to make a revolution. Would you give them any advice? Do you have any advice for how to make a revolution? You, you don't. You don't make... I mean, a revolution happens, and you either join it or you don't. <laughs> Nobody can actually make a revolution. I mean, people can, but that's not what we did. That's not what... Well, there were, there were, but there were kernels. I mean, I think there were some of the actual organizers who sparked the, these... Up these demonstrations, who had no idea it was going to snowball in quite such a fashion. But there was an organized kernel of people. Well, there uh, were demonstrations from 2000, well, really from 2000, in support of the Palestinian Intifada, and then 2003 against the invasion of Iraq, and then 2005 to protest the coming elections in Egypt, which everybody knew were going to be rigged. And from 2005 onwards, it didn't stop. There were demonstrations all the time and the police was hitting them all the time, and they kind of grew, but only a tiny bit. And then there was the murder, the police murdering the young man, Khaled Said, in June 2010. And that kind of, you know, created um, a, a sort of ground, I suppose, of, of sympathy, so that when there was a call to go out against the police on the 25th of January 2011. It was specifically against police brutality, triggered by the killing of Khaled Said, and the response was overwhelming and unexpected. And that's how it all started. So yeah, you're right that it kind of, um, that there were, there was a kernel of, of protesters, there was the Kifaya movement, um, there were several kernels but nobody knew that it would sort of coalesce and grow um, so very suddenly, absolutely. Any advice, Omar? Yeah, I mean, I think if we want to talk about revolutions and going forward and, and what's going to happen in the next 10 years, I think perhaps we need to forget about this concept of like going out onto the street and taking power. Because in the end, I don't know, with all respect to all of us in this tent, I don't know if we're the people that can actually go and take power, right? Um, so I think what we need to do as people on the left, as the people involved in ideas and discourses and language and so on, is have to recognize that a different kind of revolution is needed. And we are all actually really needing to wake up and to change our own politics and the way that we spend our money, the way that we consider ourselves as agents within an international network of corporatization and ecocide. Um, you know, the way that our... I don't know, I feel like we have all... Now, we're all now continuing to exist trapped within these national boundaries, where for me, like, I really don't think that Egypt as a national boundary is particularly relevant other than as a unit of control. Like, it's a controllable, bordered, um, you know, geological, geographical sort of mass. But actually, the systems that are controlling us and the systems that are increasingly making the decisions that determine the fate of this planet are not cognizant of those borders at all, right? They don't, those borders do not apply to them in any way, to the mineral companies, the weapons companies, the energy companies. And yet we continue to exist within these quite walled off and therefore I think increasingly useless national consciousnesses. Um, and I don't know, I mean, yeah, I think there's a general way in which like there is, the, I think it, will almost seem insane when we look back in 50 years from now and think that for so long we didn't change the way that we spent our money and didn't change the way that we traveled or thought even. And there's some sort of fundamental response to globalization that we have to go through on the left to match so, it. So the next revolution will be global. Right. Uh, Yasmin, do you, do you have anything to add on, on that? Any, any tips for revolution? I mean, your view is so broad and mine is so tiny. <laughs> well, I, I, just, I, I think you learn also that, you know, that everyone has a different role, like affecting change happens on these very different levels and you can do as much as you can, you know, I may not have be the activist going out in the street and demonstrating, but the only thing I know how to do is write and, and then there are other parameters when that, within that of continuing to write and trying not to censor, self-censor, and, you know, I feel that there are these different things that we... 
Well, thank you. I was, I was, you've just preempted the little transition I was about to make to move away from talking broadly about revolution to talking about what it's like to write about uh, extremely turbulent uh, times. Because this is something that all, all three of you have done uh, in different scales. Hadaf has written, outwritten both of you by a long way, but you've been at it longer. But, uh, <laughs> but that's sort of the reason that we're here. <laughs> right. But all of you have... have um, Egypt has been a subject for all of you, um, and uh, I think you know I I Egypt's history has been so turbulent. But in approaching, uh, and you've all written fiction as well, um, but the the sort of personal and subjective has been a very very s strong part of all of your books set in Egypt. And I was just I was just wondering. I don't know quite how to approach this with the right question, but um, what I'm trying to get at is is how do you separate the personal the subject, the personal and the, the the sort of objective, or the subjective and objective, when you're dealing with events in such a, in such a turbulent situation, as a writer, um, and uh, is that is have I made a question there? Is that a question that anyone feels competent to answer? Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to start, Omar? Well, I mean, I think you're asking why they were novels, right? And I think that's one of the things. Like, if you're writing a novel, you don't need to remove that personal subjective. Um, and you can kind of pour it in, and the novel can be full of your own opinions, and it can also be comfortable with those opinions being frozen in the moment in which that novel is representing it. So for me, in my novel, there are kind of three stages that you're going through, and in each one, it's sort of trying to really push, or what the novel is trying to do is to present how that personal subjective moment felt in each of those three different periods. And I think that's... Uh, you know, for me, I would, be very, I would have been very wary of writing a non-fiction book because it's so... Or for me, I don't think I'm able to write in a way that's divorced from the moment that I'm writing. I mean, none of us are, but I'm particularly unable to do that. So I think that was, yeah, that's what the novel can do for you. That there was a problem. I mean, several friends of mine wrote books about the revolutionary moment, and all of them regretted it because events kept moving on. I mean, you didn't know where, to, where, where was the beginning, where was the end. That's, that's, that's a difficult thing. But it's interesting that your, your book... Uh, has three different stages, and so did your book as well, Yasmin. Is that, but over a longer period of time. I mean, it, your, your, yours spans a, a couple of years, yeah. and yours spans uh, several decades, uh, Yasmin. But uh, I'm just interested in that you, you both sought that kind of perspective over, over time. Number three. Do you have a, uh, it, why, why yeah. did you construct it that way, Yasmin? I mean, I, um, and again, I think it's maybe part partly the fact that I come from a very different background is that while there was such a preoccupation with what happened in that moment, that moment of, of people finding voice, I was, I guess I was more preoccupied with the, uh, the silence that preceded and that also seemed to come after. And I, it, you know, to understand, I, I don't, my way, I didn't, I wanted to understand that behavior, I think also on a very personal level in myself. And, and I felt that the way to do that was to try to understand the, these tiny moments in the everyday that shape who you come to be. Um, and so it seemed, uh, it, it seemed like the, the best way to do that would be to look at a character over these three distinct periods of time, starting with childhood, when you really, you know, you're absorbing and you're you're taking in the behaviors of the people around you, your parents and your siblings. And so that was my... And I, and I think that there's a contrast between your two books. I mean, it's a very obvious one. I'm not saying anything very profound. But yours, yours Yasmin, is, is much more internal. I mean, and, and the, the events His are... His exciting. <laughs> Sorry? Mine was much more tedious. His was very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, that, I, that's not the, that's the, I, I was going to put, the, put it rather differently and say, saying that yours is a much more internal book with the events uh, being kind of very much a background noise, whereas in, in Omar's book, the events t are, are fly right in your face, and actually you get sort of sticky with gore uh, <laughs> to a certain extent. So they're quite different. But uh, uh, Adaf, how, do, how do you separate the, the sort of subjective from objective? I mean, you've, you've, you've dealt with... I mean, you've done novels, you've done short stories, you've done works of nonfiction, you've been engaged politically. I mean, uh, you, but your, your, your novels have a strong kernel of the subjective as well. Uh, and, and I think even, I mean, uh, how, how do you manage this or do you not want to manage it? I mean, wh where does, does Ahdaf fit into the big political picture? 
well, this is, this is the um, million dollar question right now, I guess, for me. I mean, this is the, this is the, this is the problem that I'm facing um, as I try to write fiction again. Um, like, how legitimate is it to, to work through this objective? And yet, what, how can I not? I mean, how, what other way is there to work? And so on. But, um, but the book that came out of the revolution was, uh, was, was a memoir that was, I mean, I sort of didn't, didn't go the fiction way then, that was, uh, that was a memoir of the revolution. And, uh, and in, in, its, um, in its actual structure, it also um, kind of shows how, how, how I engaged uh, with what was happening or how what was happening hit me or affected me. And it, but it was really only written because, um, because my publisher demanded it. I mean, she might be here, Alexandra Pringle, and I'm eternally grateful to her for having made me write it, but I wouldn't have sat down and volunteered. Um, and I'm full of admiration for people like the two on my left who actually managed to produce books of fiction out of, out of that experience. Uh, we have yet to see whether I can. But it's, it, uh, the, the revolutionary moment um, hasn't actually produced a great torrent of fiction. I mean, there was a sort of expectation that having this, the drama of this moment that Egypt and the rest of the Arab world lived through would create a torrent of new movies and, and so on. And it, it actually hasn't. I mean, there, there are, it's not to say there's nothing, but I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a rather low volume. I mean... Uh, Yasmin, would you ex do, do you have any idea of why that is? I mean, is it still too too fresh in people's minds? What, Maybe what is the too. I mean, I uh, I look at people around me, and many people have been in quite a lull. <laughs> of, um, I mean, there was such disappointment and depression, and um, I, I don't know. It seems early. Maybe I, I I I'm still processing. I think. I mean, I think the boom, the stuff that we've seen was like, you know, in music and in poetry and in graffiti. And then I think now, you know, there's a lot of like artistic production on Facebook and satirical stuff. I think we saw there was a big boom in Egypt of dystopian sci-fi novels. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I wonder if it's also to do with, um, you know, a sense of like kind of needing to refine the value or the purpose of art in the face of sort of such kind of brutal militarism, like you know, uh, it's not an easy question to answer. Um. And I suppose I mean in in um, sort of uh, in Arab history, uh, history of modern Arab literature, there have been these terrible moments. I mean, you know, the 1967 war was one such moment, which was just such a shock that it put people into a sort of stunned form, and. But eventually, it's, it became a source of a completely new ways of looking at things, yeah. a rather bleak way. I mean, and a lot of absurdist approaches, surrealist, uh, uh, you know, science, science fiction, slightly creepy. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, the interest. I mean, the, I found there was this interesting moment where I started hearing people refer to 2011 as the second defeat. You know, referring to '67, and with '67 came all this literature, and but I, and so I've I've wondered, you know, what eventually something will come out, certainly. But well, I think we're ready to open up to some questions from the audience, which I hope we have. I see several hands. Good, 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 good. Yeah, right over there. Uh, this gentleman over there. Oh, well, we'll start with this fellow because he's got a mic. The man with the mic can speak first. There we go. Hello, two questions. <laughs> Firstly, can you tell us about the state of civil liberties in Egypt today? And secondly, the state of the Khane Khalili market, which I absolutely love. <laughs> Should I take this? Take that, go ahead. Go. Okay, so first of all, it's really great to be here, which we omitted to say when we first stepped onto the stage. It's wonderful to be back at the Jaipur Festival, and it's wonderful to be in this like superlatively beautiful tent. And I, I love, um, I love having events in India because there isn't ever that hesitation where the floor is opened and nobody puts up their hand. There's always five or six hands straight away. And um, so the energy of that is wonderful. Uh, the state of civil liberties is extremely bad. Um, I mean, there's always worse. It could always get worse. But at the moment, it's very, very bad. There's a complete um, takeover of media, of uh, 
cultural space. Um, even things like Facebook and Twitter, there's a law being passed that if you have 5,000 followers or more, you are actually public media and will be treated by the law as such. Um, so, uh, yeah, and as I said earlier, uh, people are disappeared off the streets. Um, we have over 60,000 prisoners, uh, pr prisoners of opinion, political prisoners. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's bad. The Khan al-Khalili market, on the other hand, is uh, fine, it's thriving. It has suffered somewhat from the um, absence of tourism, but, um, but it has managed to repel an attempt that was made uh, in, during um, President Mubarak's time to turn the whole thing into an open-air museum because um, even though it looks like it's sort of poor and old, but there is very serious money there. So they gave pushback on that, and so it's um, no, it's uh, it's it's good. It's good. Come back and see it. Mm. Yes, this gentleman on the far right here. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, I actually was wondering if I have a bit of a theory about the Arab Spring in general and the Egyptian Revolution in particular. Is it a short theory? It is, it is. So, uh, in essence, social media played a very important role in galvanizing people and fostering the spirit of revolution across the Middle East at this point. I wonder how much of the outcome of this revolution has been governments trying to manipulate social media to try and control their people. How much did governments across the world look at how social media had fostered revolution during the Arab Spring and thought, you know what, we can use this to reinforce our own oppressive nature on the people, so. Would you, anyone like to address that? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think certainly um, a lot has happened in our relationship with technology since 2011, and I think 2011 was, was the high point of a kind of utopian promise of the internet, right? There was this point at which the idea was that if everybody knew all the injustices that were going on around the world, that that was the kind of crucial first step towards ending those injustices, that just the transmission of information was the key um, sort of technological hurdle that we had to get over. And I think people will remember that actually the whole world was really watching Egypt in the Arab Spring, and Egypt was the most used hashtag on Twitter of the entire year globally. Egypt, the word was banned from searches in China. Um, there was this sort of utopian promise, and I think uh, of course, on the one hand, yes, um, governments, not just governments, but also brands have learned how to really get in there and manipulate it. Our relationship with Facebook has become the internet, instead of a space in which we are building the internet and creating the internet ourselves, has become a place in which we are hosted um, and providing free labor on Facebook for their clicks and their advertising revenue. I think it also answers a little bit of your question about the novel and where is the novel. I think it's also... A lot of our self-expression has gone into Facebook uh, rather than into other artistic forms. And I think also um, it's further atomized us, right? So now instead of going out, I mean, one of the key things that happened when this huge street protest that actually toppled the Mubarak government gathered its main momentum was the 28th of January. And the day before that, the government had switched off the internet for the entire country. And so the crucial thing was that people actually had to go out onto the street to find out what was going on. Um, and so it's also atomized us into individual, domestic, uh, monitored um, consumers. And politics has become part of what we're consuming. I think fundamentally, another thing that has changed is that before, the very basic idea of a politics was that you and someone else had a shared worldview, and you went out to do something about it, and then you became four people, and then you become six people, and then you become a city council, and then you become... But now, and so each time, you know, you have your politics is grounded in your own local relationship with the people you live with, the land you work on, the, the problems around you. And now there has been this complete inversion of politics where our politics now is that you go on Twitter as an individual in your room or on your phone and you see the problems of the entire world scrolling past you, scrolling past you, scrolling past you. They're in your pocket 24 hours a day. And there's nothing you can do about it because you are on your own with your phone. And so it's, been a, it's a complete inversion of what politics is. And it's to, totally, totally, totally disempowering to all of us and guilt-inducing because you, it ha, it's in your pocket all the time and you're not looking at it and you're not weeping over 
victim X or crime Y or whatever, because there are just too many and you can't keep up with it. Um, so in a way, the governments don't even need to be actively doing anything about it. It's so destabilizing to us anyway. And of course they are, they're on there and they're surveilling us. And um, So it's kind of a perfect storm and I, I think it's really, the internet has become the key cipher of control now of um, you know, the various regimes in which, which are kind of keeping us in our place as sort of static consumers. I think also, I mean, governments all over, uh, particularly dictatorial governments, have seen, have seen the so-called so color revolutions as a sort of petri dish, as a template for how to prevent such things. I mean, and they've just done every single possible thing to plug those gaps. Uh, you know, and plugging the gaps is the kind of, that's the sort of terminology that you hear used in a lot of, uh, you know, uh, governments these days. Um, let's see, we need another question. Oh, right in the front. Yes, great. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, so my question is to all of you. Uh, how do you feel about um, media coverage that comes from the West in terms of revolutions like these? I mean, uh, at least speaking from an Indian perspective, every time there's something explosive, there's a slight bit of apprehension about maybe something seeming slightly orientalist when it's covered. How do you feel about it? Because, of course, um, there is a lot of media coverage from all over the world, and media is getting more, more and more global. But there still seems to be a bit of a divide in the perspective that comes in from the West while covering something like this. So how do you feel about that? Would like to... Yes. I mean, I always have a strong reaction to it, but I am like, very timid in my writing and I like this gray area of nuance. And so I find that it's always so spun in some direction or another, um, but which has a purpose, but I have, uh, I admit that I have a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to it as someone from the place and who's lived there my whole life. And um, I react quite strongly. Well, they've forgotten about us for the moment anyway, so that's, that's nice, that's good. Um, and I think, I, th I, th I agree with you that there is always a bit of an orientalist streak. I think we actually did um, break out of that for a while um, in th as the Egyptian revolution was happening. I think people sort of, people sat up and paid attention and, and, and a lot of people actually flew in and we're actually, I mean, international journalists and so on, and we're actually like caught up in it. We're actually sort of seriously moved and felt part of things. And, and so there was a moment, and, and interestingly and somewhat ironically, it was the moment when we actually didn't care how we were written about or how this was all sort of, it was to do with us and not to do with how we were portrayed and so on. But during that moment when we didn't care, um, the discourse was different, and then it kind of obviously, it, you know, it, it goes back. There was something really interesting when the uh, Paris, the uh, Gilets Jaunes thing happened, and a couple of smart Arab commentators on uh, Twitter and Facebook were sort of like reporting on it as though it were an Arab thing, you know, commenting and asking questions in the way that the Western media, you know, do we think this is good? And, and that was really brilliant. It was a great way of putting, you know, forward what, how we were treated. And I think there's a, because I represent the, 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 the imperialist uh, uh, orientalist press, I have to say something. Well, I was going to tee Max up. I was going to say, actually, you know, Max, you know, oh. as one of the, uh, as a journalist who really is not ever orientalist that was there and got it right every time, and you would always click on an article by Max Rodenbeck, and so perhaps this was actually, yeah, I was going to say. Max is like ask. honorary Egyptian. Oh, well, that's, that's not what I was going to say. I wasn't going to say any of that. I was just going to say that the press has this horrible relentlessness that, you know, it's a giant spotlight that moves to the, the action, wherever it is. And then the, you know, reporters from wherever, whether they're Western or not, tend to fly in and watch what's happening, but they try to speak back to their audience in the language that their audience understands. And that language can be very annoying to the, the, the people who are being described. Uh, uh, you know, and I think sometimes that's Orientalist, but it could be something, you might describe it as something else as well. Occidentalist or anything, I mean, but the language that's used by you know, the press to describe what it's looking at is a language intended to make it clear to the particular audience that it's aimed at. You know, so that always has to be kept in, in mind. Anyway, let's, let's zip along and see if we can. Uh, yes, there's a gentleman here on the left. 
to any of the panelists, why do you think uh, this revolution failed? Or has any revolution, sorry, not, that's not my question. Has any revolution succeeded uh, recently or turned upside down? People have become more responses, responsive to injustices. So what is in your view what's happening? That's a very broad question. I, shall we, shall we, yeah. you know, when you say has any revolution succeeded, are we going back to the, the French and the... You said recently. Oh, recently. Yeah. Well, the Tunisians did all right. The Tunisians have more or less, yeah, more or less succeeded. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, Yang is better than, they're doing better than we are. I think revolutions at this, in this age are actually, I mean, as, as is proved by what happened across so many countries uh, in a short time, it's actually very difficult now. I mean, because of the, the tools of control are, are stronger than ever, um, it's actually quite difficult. And that's, that's what was proved, I, I think. Um, you know, that, that uh, if you look back a little bit longer over the last 60 years or so, uh, you know, there were, there were more successful revolutions in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s than there have been more recently. I think maybe also if we just um, try and just broaden our spectrum a little bit, and if revolution is sort of like using you, yourself to try and create political space and political change, if we can include Palestine in there, then that is a remarkable... Um, I mean, I won't even say example because I don't know anywhere else in the world that would do this. But what is happening in Gaza, where Friday after Friday after Friday, people go out to try and change the status quo while they are killed, you know, just sort of shot at and sniped and, and so on. Um, and the uprising across the, the West Bank, um, you know, in the face of terrifically brutal uh, sort of... Uh, you know, repression and of world collusion. I think that's remarkable. And so while they have not succeeded in winning um, freedom or independence or even civil rights, they're certainly not defeated. And that's something I think that maybe we sh could all learn from and keep an eye on. Yeah, at the far, far back, there's a... There's a I, I, sorry, sorry the, the lady behind you, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. This is a fascinating conversation. I lived in Egypt about 25 years ago in the Mubarak years, and it seems to me that, the, that in a sense, the elastic stretch in one direction, it's gone back to where it was. So the question in my mind, I guess, is where does this go? What does Egypt 25 years from now look like? Personally, I'm going to be dead. <laughs> I mean, Egypt 25 years from now looks like the same as everywhere 25 years from now looks like. It looks like a small, militarily backed elite who live behind walls and barbed wire with vast police forces in control of the dwindling resources that the earth has to offer us for the last two generations. Egypt in 25 years is the same, you know, we'll look not any different than anywhere else. I mean, everywhere is going through the same process. It's concentration of wealth and power and technologies of control at the top and increasing impoverization and immiseration of everybody else as the planet is drained of its final resources. And a plastic wasteland. And plastic. Plastic wasteland. And just, yeah, which is what, yeah. So you, do, do you agree with that sort of dystopian vision? I mean, I do, but I really, this younger generation, I feel that they have an energy that is, I just don't think it's going to remain contained. I don't know what's going to happen or when, but I don't think they are going to be pacified. I just don't believe it. I'm not saying it's guaranteed, and like otherwise we just kill ourselves now, but you know, I'm saying that is the future that is being designed, right? And that's the thing that we have to deal with. Right, that is that, that's the actual current plan. Game, yeah, that's that's, where, the we're game that's plan. where the flight is landing. Right, right. Well, I, I think, I, you know, I, I don't know if I'm being Id idiotically optimistic, but, uh, um, you know, if you look at the long... E Egypt is the oldest nation on, on... We talked about borders, but Egypt's borders really haven't changed for, for 4,000 years or so. Um, and in that time, there have been something like uh, 50 dynasties under, whole, you know, Romans, ancient Egypt, uh, you know, Islamic dynasties, et cetera, et cetera. And... Um, this dynasty, 
which started in about 1952 with the military coup, um, I, I think it has a lifespan too, which will you know end at some point. I just don't know when. But will the planet survive? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, if well, we're talking a, about dynasties that last sort of hundreds and hundreds of years, I mean, things are moving faster now. Yeah, that's a, that's a longer time frame. Uh, I think we had a we had a gentleman who was trying to ask a question earlier. Yeah. My question, uh, I actually have two questions. One, um, did the Arab Spring fail because of lack of leadership? I can draw a parallel to that. In India, the war of uh, the 1857, the first war of independence failed despite having more numerical numbers and better armory because of lack of leadership. Did the same thing apply to Arab Spring, nobody came forward to take control when things were going their way. And uh, my second question is to Omar. I, 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 I'm quite impressed with your passion for the left. But hasn't history taught us that left leads to a totalitarian um, regime, one party regime, where some men are more equal than others. There is lack of liberty. Freedom of expression is not there. We have seen some examples across the globe. They are still there today. So that's something to think about. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I mean, I can just start. I mean, I, I'm not a, I'm not a communist. You know, I, I've been much more of a sort of anarchist. Um, I think the left is what we need to think about in terms of an opposition to the right fundamentally, but I'm not looking to construct a sort of strong centralized state bureaucracy to sort of administer state socialism. I think uh, you know, we need to sort of destroy all of those structures, but the left is the vehicle through which we can kind of conceive of our opposition for now. And I, I think uh, uh, Ahdaf earlier addressed the question about leadership and lack of leadership, so we might just move on to another question. I, think, I mean, yes, lack of leadership was a problem. Uh, here in the front, uh, oh sorry, Madam, yeah, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you all. It's, oh, I have to stand up, okay. Um, this is so interesting and just so intelligent and so just illuminating. But my question for the three of you is, have you had or what's the level of interference, if there is any, um, with your writing activities, be they fiction, nonfiction, speaking out um, on the part of the state, beyond what I assume is surveillance of some sort. Thank you. Well, we're all here. Um, so there is, a, there is a sort of gray zone allowed, I think. Um, speaking for myself, I don't know if everyone else agrees, but I think writing in English doesn't disturb them as much as writing in Arabic. Um, that doesn't apply to you so much as it does to... Um, I think there is basically, there's a sort of broad levels of censorship. I mean, you, you can't publish in a newspaper. Uh, the website that I write for is blocked. Um, they like to create a sense of general self-censorship where you don't know where the red lines are, right, and what's going to catch their attention, what's going to bring the eye on you, and that's very effective. Um, well, um, yeah, speak, uh, personally, from 20, I, fr I had a, a column, a weekly column in Al Shuruq, which is the daily um, Egyptian national, and that ran for about four years. Uh, anyway, that's been stopped. Um, so it was stopped a couple of years ago. Um, and basically, and yeah. So, so uh, Adaf, when you say stopped, what happens when it's stopped? I mean, you get, a, you get a little notice saying... No, no, you don't get a little notice. I mean, the publisher is, is, is a friend, and he's my publisher, and he owns the thing. And he was becoming more and more uncomfortable. And he was telling me how hard they were leaning on him. Um, and so eventually there was a moment when it kind of was done delicately, but, you know, he was being lent on, um, and all sort of... Me it doesn't work like that. Yeah. I mean, who was leaning on him was somebody in power in the military who knew him. And so it was done at receptions, at dinners. There wasn't an official notification from the Ministry of Information. It was sort of like, you know, a friend would lean over and say, you know, you really need to stop 
and it's not just me. I mean, there are other people much more important than me. But basically, media has closed down so that even if some young, well-intentioned person uh, gets in touch and says, we'd like you to do this, we'd like you to talk about that, we'd like you to judge this, and I say, oh, would you really? Uh, yeah, absolutely we would, and then they vanish. So that's a sort of total shutdown. Of course, they can't shut down the media in the West that I write for, um, but I no longer see the point of describing what is happening in a British or an American newspaper. So I've shut myself down on, on that front. So, you know, there we are. But again, as Omar said, we're here, we're, you know, talking, so um, that's fine. A lot of, a lot of my friends um, are now prohibited from traveling. Uh, their passports have been taken. Others have had their uh, bank accounts frozen. So, you know, it just yeah. depends what happens one day. And if you're asking about official mechanisms, there are a matrix of laws that they choose to apply or not apply, and there's a new law about the media and forcing independent media to register and jump through certain hoops and file everything with the Ministry of the Interior. There's this other law that if you have 5,000 followers, then you can be prosecuted for publishing fake news. There are colonial laws that they reenact and uh, sort of revivify, saying you're not allowed to print any information about the security services, so you publish a book with the word army in it, and then you wait and see what's going to happen. So there's a range of different... If your publisher agrees to publish it, I mean, we now have yeah, two exactly. books waiting to be published. And then this year they've arrested several publishers, you know, so now all of the publishers that might have previously been interested in sort of publishing something that was slightly avant-garde and now, you know, have their backs against the wall because there's three publishers of minor independent houses that are in jail, and so, you know, this is... It's bleak. Um, I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Just so that you... Hi, Harry Garson for Omar. Um, I wanted to ask you about the whole uh, removing national borders that you were talking about, and specifically about how you said um, we should change the way we spend. So I want to know what you meant by that and how the left will go about uh, removing the national borders that exist. How the left goes about removing that. Well, it's <laughs> difficult in two minutes. It's very difficult. Um, a vision. Well, the way that we spend, I mean, look at what we consume, right? And look at the way that our money, I mean, I don't know how it is here, but, um, but I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's, um, we are constantly and continually complicit in propping up both the kind of globalized, global corporations that we know are ultimately ruining the planet, um, in the way with the, what we consume, you know, from bottled water to Coca-Cola to um, you know, the insane amounts of meat that the world consumes. Uh, it's not so much the case in India, well done on the cow front. Um, but everywhere else, you know, uh, um, you know, the way that we travel, the way that we consume energy, when energy is the finite thing that ultimately we're gonna run out of unless they kind of create the solar panel that might actually just change everything but they seem unable to do or the battery. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know how, I mean, we can't personally, I don't know, yeah, yeah I've got well, myself stuck here. No, you have, you, I mean, your ideas or the ideas of the people that I hear you all talking about are, all to, are also to do with decentralization, for example. So I think, and certainly what, what was felt during the revolution was that, that, and what you feel when you look at what's happening elsewhere in the world is that something is trying to be born which involves sort of diluting this idea of national boundaries, diluting the idea of central government and having much, a much more widespread democratic sort of a ground level um, sort of, you know, decision making and running things uh, structure. Um, and therefore you wouldn't have the whole issue of sort of immigration, people being stopped at the borders and dying and so on. And, and so I think that when Omar talks about national boundaries. I, th I think that is something that, that a lot of, of people in the world, and therefore your question, are, are really moving towards that maybe there is a different, a, a smaller, a more planet-friendly, uh, people-friendly way of running the world than the sort of, you know, states with their borders and the huge sort of military industrial complex that's required to sustain them and so on, that there is something much more people-based that would ensure the survival of the planet and would make life 
you know, much more livable for, for people in general that is being dreamed of and aimed at. Well, I think we are, Omar we are is starting the revolution. Yeah. I think well, Omar is going to lead the revolution. We have to answer that question. Yeah, but yes. we, we have, I'm afraid that we have to, we have to yeah. stop. Yeah. Uh, 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 we are going to change the world. Uh, it's all going to happen, but it's not going to happen in this session, which is actually over. Uh, we're out yes, of time, I'm afraid. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, so thank you very much. We are running out of time, but big round of applause for Adaf Swave, Omar Robert Hamilton. Yes.